Good morning, everyone. Alex here again. Um, I feel like now I'm just going to end up reading the bio that's up here. <laughs> There's no big reveal here. So good morning again. And to our distinguished speaker, I say, how's it? <laughs> we have someone here all the way from South Africa. So it's very exciting to have somebody who's in a place that's close to my heart. Um, so Hela Lotsitka is a distinguished professor at Rhodes University and holds a tier one South African National Research Foundation chair in transformative social learning and green skills learning pathways um, at, at Rhodes University in South Africa. Um, her research interests include critical research methodologies, transformative environmental learning, agency and education systems transformation. Looking forward to hearing your talk so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And good morning, everybody. It's been a long journey to get here, <laughs> but I'm so happy to be here and in fact, very honored to be here. I've heard that this is one of the most creative research communities in the world. So <laughs> I'm very excited to be here today with all of you. I think what Alex didn't say was that I used to be a grade one teacher. And the one thing that you learn when you're a grade one teacher is you learn to believe in the future because you're working with a most incredible young minds and you know this curiosity about life and I think that's probably what's brought me all the way here uh, 30 something years afterwards so I sort of feel like I've always been involved in in the future and um, but as time went on I sort of started to think about you know what kind of future what kind of future are we offering young people in education today and I guess that's what's uh, where I am now uh, with this work. So I want to share with you some thoughts today, and they really are just thoughts uh, on expansive learning. And what I'm working on at the moment is the notion of possibility knowledges for regenerative futures. And I come from a place called the Environmental Learning Research Center at Rhodes University in South Africa, which is uh, sort of on the southeast coast of South Africa. It's a small town um yeah and I was uh, born in South Africa and have grown up there and that of course imbues one with so much uh, possibility knowledge and also hope for the future so I'll share some of that with you as well as we go along so I wanted to start just with appreciation for the invitation to be here thank you very very much a whole year of emails <laughs> and i'm not one that's very good on email actually i kind of like just get completely overwhelmed by it most of the time but i do appreciate uh, all of the work that has been put into bringing us here the kindness the care the flexibility in steering the program and the arrangements that have brought us here so i'm very appreciative of that and i'm also appreciative of a, all research communities that allow us to speak with emerging grammars, with open, open space and open minds. So that's what I'm also excited about being here today. So I'm going to talk about regenerative futures. I was trying to think, how do you start when such a huge field, a field as huge as anticipatory futures, and it's incredibly complex and there's so much going on in it and it's just so exciting. And where do you start? So I thought, okay, I'll start here with regenerative futures and with the notion that these are arising everywhere and that they are actually actioning anticipation. And I'm so interested also in the actioning that you also opened up with uh, Cynthia. And I thought I'd start with a plastic bottle. <laughs> I can't believe it. You know, I was traveling here uh, literally ooh, nearly 40 hours of aeroplane flights and I can't tell you how many plastic bottles and they just make your heart bleed don't they every time you see a plastic bottle and I'm so grateful for the for the the bottles that we were given this morning but they in a way really challenge one to think about what uh, regenerative futures uh, need to be like because they really force us to rethink and to think about restoring and replenishing and reframing and just, you know, it's moving beyond reduce, reuse and recycle, which of course has been quite a strong and important paradigm and we don't want to get rid of it, we need it. But this uh, regenerative framework really helps us to, I think, move, move further with, with that early work. But I just absolutely love this project. It's a project that comes from uh, uh, Johannesburg 
the sort of inner cities of Johannesburg. And it's a project where they were trying to reframe and reimagine and rethink with the plastic bag. And you can see yeah, these children. And you know, one of the challenges is that 1.2 million plastic bags are sold per minute. 1.5 billion plastic bottles are sold per day. It takes 700 years for one plastic bottle to degenerate. And all of this goes on while children are hungry. And uh, this is what sort of what I really liked about this project is that it was really trying to, you know, stir up what's going on here and try to reframe. So what they did is they started the social movement project with children and taking these plastic bottles and then they were getting each child to write a little message of hope inside the plastic bottle. And it was used as a quite a big fundraising initiative to try to provide food and uh, security for these children. And of course, during the pandemic, many of our children were very badly affected by a loss of food security in our society as the first thing that happened with the pandemic is the fallout around availability and, and security of food. And of course, that hits the children first and most. So this eventually became this uh, amazing social sculpture called Itemba Tower. Every plastic bottle has got a message of hope in, even has little lights in and they light up. But, and this is an artist, an artist that is just, you know, trying to help us to reframe and rethink, produce more gen regenerative uh, ways of thinking about the world. And there's so much going on in South Africa, in Africa, when it comes to regenerative futures. You know, people often have, you know, very sort of negative views of Africa, but in fact, it's an incredibly creative place. And we can see our scientists, you know, really working hard to try to come through with regenerative futures. This is a, a new publication that's come out of UCT, the Future Water Institute, a fantastic institution. And there they're trying to work on regenerative water futures, trying to, to kind of work their way through these like, incredibly difficult tensions around water scarcity in the mining industry because we have like extremely high levels of acid mine drainage and you know really awful forms of of mine uh, water pollution which i'll talk about a bit later you can see it there the sort of orange orangeness of the water just like ah. and this is in a water scarce country i thought you'd appreciate it being here it's quite sort of dry when you look out the airplane window <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to explore it, but it's quite similar, actually, a, a very sort of dry kind of country that really needs to take care of its water and then isn't because of the politics and the power of these, these kinds of institutions. There's also regenerative tourism that's emerging, which is trying to create the conditions for life to continuously renew itself, to transcend into new forms and to flourish amid ever-changing life conditions. It's just so beautiful, isn't that, sort of the creativity of, of the notion of regenerativity, and you can see it in that particular quote there. There's also regenerative fashion with clean cotton. Much needed. You know, one of the first colonial, colonial impacts in Africa was the cotton industry, the cotton and the uh, cotton industries, and they actually started research in Africa was to bring colonial research to to make the cotton industries work. So, you know, there's something interesting about just behind that beautiful picture, but it's actually about reimagining how the world can be. Regenerative agriculture, there's also quite a big movement emerging there, especially amongst with women smallholder farmers at the forefront. And this is very vital for Africa. We have 200, over 200 million small scale farmers, and they actually produce, these women are the women who produce Africa's food. One of my former PhD students is leading the AFSA, which is the uh, African Food Sovereignty Alliance, one of the biggest social movements in Africa, working with smallholder farmers to, you know, introduce agroecology and regenerative agricultural practices, very vibrant uh, communities who are not often seen, actually, but who are, you know, just so important for the livelihood and the pulse of, of Africa. This is a project that's established by one of my, our PhD students, and it's just a simple initiative, regenerative eco-social activity to clean up the beaches and to pick up all these bits of plastic that end up there floating through and into the oceans. I think everybody is much aware of those kinds of issues. 
but it's what I really wanted to do is just to open up with some of these sort of possibilities of what is happening and that we can see movement when it comes to regenerative futures and cultures in in Africa. And I love this quote actually at its simplest regeneration is about creating the fertile conditions conducive for life to thrive. And this picture is from the Western Cape during the pandemic. And it was an organization that started a, a, a sort of very rapid response project, one bag full, and it was really trying to you know, bring food to children. And I told you that that was one of the major fallouts uh, when the pandemic hit us. And of course, it just shows the deep seated fissures in society that need to be addressed. Um, so for me, this is what anticipatory futures is or ought to be about, despite its multi-streams and complex makeup. And I think if we can, you know, take that complexity and the different streams and bring it uh, to, into focus for life to thrive, I love the opening and the intentionality of the center and the laboratory, you know, just indicating that same uh, aspiration. So rising regenerative cultures uh, involve many different things, and it's actually interesting that when you bring them all together, you can see exactly where the edges of the, the transformative movements are or need to be in our societies, and we need all of these to be happening at the same time, and that, of course, is the challenge. So we need regenerative materials, products, and production processes. We need kind, inclusive, democratic politics communities and practices that include the more than human in their views of life and relations. We need collective agency to take back ownership and also to take up stewardship of our workplaces, lives, our communities, land, water, systems, and our air. And we need to fundamentally reframe economy, economies and financial systems to be orientated towards social justice and the common good. And this one, I think, is the most difficult, actually. It's the one that we still haven't got grips with. It's the one that, yeah, leaves us all a bit stumped, I think. Um, and then we need change drivers and change makers just to be ordinary citizens, everybody to be a change driver and a change maker with a will to co-create a better world where life can thrive. So this is what's involved in this kind of work. <laughs> this is my current favorite. I have this way of like, I collect these examples of these most creative things that people do in this sort of space of regenerative. This is my favorite. I absolutely love it. It's an economy of love. And it's a certification standard for products that are sustainable, ethic and ethical and transparent throughout the supply chain. And they say that we believe that through a transparent economic system, responsible consumers and producers can actively protect nature and ensure that every person across the supply chain is fairly compensated and protected from exploitation. Economy of love is also a community of companies, farms, and consumers working to create an economy based on respect and compassion towards people and nature. And it was initiated by an organic farmers association to support sustainable farmers, companies, and consumers. And here, I love the quote, economy of love means that I understand your challenges and you understand mine. So we can support one another with love and respect. And if only <laughs> our societies could operate like that, I think we would be in such a much better place. So I, I love this one. It's just one of my current favorites. I have a different favorite quite often, by the way, but this one has been standing there for a while. Um, and then I think the possibility of regenerative futures is deeply intertwined with the potential of healing the earth and her people, giving a chance to those that are threatened and excluded, including future generations and our biodiversity. And I think once we start to understand what's happening to our biodiversity and also the conditions that we are creating for future generations, I think it becomes so much more important for us to work on this concept of regenerative futures. So I want to talk now more about possibility knowledges, because for me as an educator, it's here in the, in the space of possibility knowledges that this type of practice begins to emerge. Um, 
And of course, possibility knowledge is, is quite a complex concept because it's, it surfaces so many philosophical and methodological debates uh, in the sciences, you know, the limits of positivism and empiricist ontologies, challenges the over-reliance on naturalism in the sciences and one-dimensional rationalism in the social sciences. It challenges the very categories of modern institutional knowledges and how they've been constructed, how they've been established, and also how they've been legitimated. It challenges how we view and work with knowledges in education and in everyday learning. Um, and of course, this is not relativist or post-truthish, uh, but rather, I think it ushers in very challenging new ways of thinking about rigor, validity, credibility, plurality, and what counts under what conditions and how. So, and it brings, for me, it brings this local to planetary relational criterion with life and justice into focus epitomized, by the way, by the plastic bottle. <laughs> so we'll continue with that plastic bottle. And of course, possibilities on knowledges are not new. They are part of the human condition. Uh, they have always been part of our societies, but they've also been significantly suppressed, and particularly by the sort of modern colonial modernity and its logics, including uh, racism, patriarchy, and so on. So the best of these are often found, interestingly enough, uh, but not only, of course, uh, carried in and by the arts and social movements. So you can usually, if you're looking into the arts and social movements, you can find the edges of these possibility knowledges. And uh, I've got this picture up here. This uh, Amandla is a revolution in four-part harmony. It's the uh, struggle music that actually carried the South African struggle movement, the music produced by the artists, so significant in, in holding and shaping, moving a revolution forward. I put the suffragettes up here, because you know, <laughs> a couple of hundred years ago, we wouldn't have been allowed to vote. Yes, imagine. <laughs> and of course, that's not such a bit uh, long ago, that was the case for black people in South Africa. They had no political rights. And the work of Nelson Mandela and the, the African National Congress, you know, uh, and his point that I'm not free until we're all free. Uh, long, uh, hard struggle. We see it today here and elsewhere. We see it amongst the children across the world. Uh, not happy with what's being taught in the curriculum when it comes to climate science, climate change. And we see it in the art, art world, and we're seeing more and more commitment to these sort of arts, arts and acts of transgression and the word transgression rising in, in power uh, in the world around us as well. So very interesting, because I think these are indicators or spaces where you begin to, begin to appreciate possibility knowledges. From, from my own experience, this, of course, this was, you know, right where I was in the student movement in the early early 1980s, mid 1980s, and it was just that time when the uh, apartheid government was being, you know, shifting itself internally and in order to open up uh, the politics of the country. Eventually in 1990, um, leading to the uh, unbanning of the African National Conference. And then just when I went back to do my master's study, was then Stellenbosch and just behind Stellenbosch, Mandela was released and that opened up oh, so much possibility in our society. We really moved into transforming the education system, the curricula. We were able to bring environmental education into the national system of education and much more social justice and human rights and so on. And carried in the music, you know, I wish I could have brought, I wanted to bring this song to you. It's such a beautiful song, but please do go and listen to it. It brings Maria Makeba and Nina Simone together, and they sing Tula Siswe, which is I Shall Be Released. It's a song about Mandela's release. And again, carried in the music in these, you know, great divas of uh, America and, and South Africa. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, possibility knowledges are really, I guess, part both of our, our experience of life and then they always changing shape because the world around us is changing so much and so quickly. 
And the one that's so complex is this one around climate change. And just there's so many dimensions. I was looking at blockchain, blockchain rain, look at it. <laughs> it's going to solve our problems. And then we have dystopias, we have uh, techno fixes, we have activism, we have policy forums, we have just so much stuff, imagination. And all of it is important, but it becomes very complex to work out what to do, how to approach this kind of knowledge and what to do with it in society. So this multidimensional focus of possibility knowledges today, I think is highly complex and can be challenging with so many historical futures now evident to us. There's diverse anticipatory movements. I think all of you know more about that than I do. Diverse temporalities. I was just at a meeting in the UK with Kerry Fassa and a group on temporalities. So interesting. So much different perspectives on temporality, configurations and rhythms, geospatial realities, biotechnic, techno sciences, socialities and theories, political ecologies, multi levels, economies, materialities, whew, and epistemic multiplicities on top of all of that. <laughs> How are we supposed to cope? <laughs> yes, and this is a challenge for all people in society. You get to the point of how are we supposed to cope and what should we focus on? It's tough. So I always go back to this. It always helps me to go back and think about a child that needs food because that helps you just to ground all of this thinking. You know? So if we're looking at this blockchain climate, tech, science, is it going to actually, in the end of the day, help us to do that? Because I think if we can't stay focused on something so important, we may just lose our way. And that brings me to the notion of dominant knowledge categories. And, you know, how do we now make a differentiation between uh, knowledge, the knowledge, knowledge environment that we're in and I love this work of Yurio Engerstrom. He's a fantastic uh, educational scientist working on expansive learning research. And I've worked a lot with his work over the last 20, 30 years. But he makes this point that uh, we have a tendency to categorize knowledge based on formal ways of knowing, for example, tacit knowledge, explicit knowledge, narrative, paradigmatic, intuitive, indigenous, scientific, disciplinary, inter, trans. So we categorize our forms of knowledge. And then he says that to deal with contemporary challenges in complex societies, it may be more helpful to think about knowledge and its uses. In other words, for example, helping life to thrive. How, in other words, how do people deploy knowledges in shaping their futures? And then from this perspective and in building regenerative futures together, he says we can consider two different types of knowledge. He talks about stabilization knowledge and possibility knowledge. And that's really inspired me a lot to, to do this, this work. So he goes on to talk about stabilization knowledge, and he talks about how we produce, how we try to stabilize knowledge, uh, to freeze and to simplify something that's constantly shifting and otherwise bewildering. It turns problematics into sort of closed phenomena that can be registered, named, captured, fixed, bounded, categorized. And even narratives can stabilize, if only temporarily. And then he says that it's not evil. Stabilization is not evil. It is actually necessary and important for our survival in a complex world. And it takes a lot of work to do this stabilization work. And you only have to look at these climate models that are being produced for us every couple of years, you know, through the IPCC. And they're like so important, so helpful for our societies to begin to think about you know, the movement that, that is necessary. Um, but they also are, you know, uh, can tend to become a bit fixed and so on. So it's, he says it's hard work and it's very important and it is collaborative achievement because it helps us, you know, to hold these complex objects still enough to be brought into focus. And of course, one needs that if you, you need to be able to just, you know, take a step, you have to have that stabilization. But then I think equally you need this possibility knowledge. And that emerges when one can depict meanings in movement and transformation. So when we take these stabilized categories and we begin to see them move and shift into forms of transformation, then we, we can see these possibility knowledges coming through. So it, uh, we can trace transitions of positions in the field, 
we can see where knowledge gets destabilized, gets put into movement, and it opens up possibilities. So possibility knowledge is essentially a gent of knowledge, and it's the instrumentality of agency at work. It helps people to move. It helps people to do things. So that actionability is necessary. We need possibility knowledge for actionability. Here's a lovely, just a picture of, you know, a local uh, um, a speckworm. It's a, a, a plant that is used to produce carbon sequestration, very high level high capability for carbon sequestration. So you can see the activity here, that, that possibility knowledge from understanding the stabilized understandings of climate change. We know we're getting hotter, it's getting tougher, we've got to do something. Oh, okay, we can, you know, do some, some of this kind of stuff with the speckworm plant. Um, so, yeah, so to learn new ways of living, learning, and working, there's need to destabilize categories that fix and to mobilize and to put knowledge into movement, to create possibilities for new forms of agency to emerge. And we have to co-learn what is not yet there. And this is at the intersection of past and future in the present. So this is kind of the challenge. It's the work that needs doing. And I want to just share with you a few examples from our research community, this is from the center where I'm, I'm working. Here you can see our amazing researchers. They're full of energy, vibrant, colorful, colorful research. And uh, yeah, just enjoying what they do. So these researchers are heavily invested in mobilizing and co-creating possibility knowledges for regenerative futures of diverse kinds. It's the work that they do, we call it our T-learning work transformative, transgressive learning. Here's one example from Malawi, where one of the, the researchers took, who was working with, you know, very, a very poor woman, who in fact uh, were actually uh, using sawdust to supplement the maize meal because the food shortage was so bad. And that was because the lake kept on drying out. And each time the lake dries, they end up with very serious food insecurity problems. So he used scenarios that he developed with them to try to surface their indigenous knowledge and to use that to challenge the stabilized knowledge of the extension officers who were trying to get them to do agro, 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 uh, agricultural practices that were not actually working for the woman. And they knew that their, their knowledge was better and they could produce more food with that knowledge. And through that process, they were able to shoops, actually, you know, get quite a, a big uh, shift in that particular context. So that's, you know, very short one slide of a huge, huge, huge piece of work, you know, four or five year piece of work. But I'm, so I'm just giving you a very quick snapshot. Here's another one, also a multi-year program working with farmers. And this one was farmers were given back their land and they needed to find water for their food, but there, was not, there wasn't really much water. So there were two forms of stabilized knowledge. One was being produced by the scientific community, lots of knowledge about rainwater harvesting and cons conservation in books published, millions of rands worth of books that were being published, but not being used. And then there was also stabilized indigenous knowledge. And so what these researchers did was they kind of unlocked these two forms of stabilized knowledge into possibility knowledge and into a range of demonstration practices that then kind of unlocked ways of uh, using rainwater for growing food in this community. Here's another example. This one is from Zimbabwe. And here the, the process was to try to mobilize stabilized experience of silo mentalities and monocultures of agriculture to build solidarity and network relations amongst organic farmers associations across scales. And again, a multi-year project and ongoing work over time to do, you know, and this kind of constant process of unlocking, sort of destabilizing and then mobilizing and destabilizing and mobilizing, same process. And you can see the work here going on. Here's one around the mine affected communities. And this, these ones are tough because of the, the power relations between mine affected communities and the mines that are just literally throwing this stuff into the rivers and people having to actually, you know, drink this water at times or use the water for their household uh, practices. So working there with 
uh, social movement groups to mobilize stabilized knowledge of toxic water pollution and widespread models and ana analyses of acid mine drainage problems. And what they did there was to create social movements and tools for holding the mines to account. So even in these very heavy power laden settings, it is possible to get this kind of movement uh, coming through. This one also very interesting, also a multi-year project focusing on communities getting their land back and then the uh, technology that is being used is to establish common property associations, but the communities are not trained to, to use these new instruments and they actually without you know, quite a lot of work, these new instruments actually become failures. So just working slowly with these communities to unlock these different forms of stabilized knowledge and then create uh, uh, new capabilities to manage the land, take ownership of their land and so on. This one is in the student movement. One of my PhD students did a fantastic study working with young people, trying to open up their concepts of, of education to destabilize the stabilized understandings of education and how education is and should be and how the young people wanted education to be. So, you know, the rising cultures of young people and trying to think about what that means for liberatory pedagogy. He has a, a, a very high profile project which is doing fantastic work. It's working with the um, oceans, One Ocean Hub, and they are doing very interesting work using theatre uh, anthropology with communities, and then they turn it into theatre and then they play it back. But it's like quite extensive, also multi year work. And then they play these uh, plays all along the coast. And in fact, they are at this moment at the COP27 and playing, doing the play to some of the major decision makers there. I'll show you a picture just now, but this is the kind of work that they do. So they take this play, produce a play with the stabilized knowledge, and then in the, through the play, they open it up for this engaged deliberation with people. And they've been incredibly successful with this. They've done it on quite a grand scale or quite a huge scale. You can see the different uh, things there, but they actually managed to stop shell seismic surveys off the wild coast in South Africa and transformed the foundations of environmental law using these uh, practices. And here's the article of them just coming through now from the uh, COP27 in uh, Egypt, which is going on at the moment. So, you know, just in, in sort of some, of some of this work, you know, it's really quite hard to imagine how we're we going to respond to the global changes, for example, climate change, persistent social equalities and other risks, without transgressively reimagining and reframing human learning processes and systems via this process of proactively mobilizing possibility knowledges and agency for change. So we've worked quite hard on this for quite a number of years also with the International Science Council. And we are trying to kind of understand, you know, the differences between transformative, transgressive, transdisciplinary and collective social learning. And we, be, we kind of are framing it out quite nicely and getting further nuance as we go along. And this is generating a new kind of research on learning and then also possibilities for education system transformation. So that's the sort of bigger picture of what we're doing. And we're learning a lot about this kind of learning. And I'll just share some of it with you before I wrap up. But, you know, some of the important things to do is to create time and space for co-defining matters of concern with people, identifying the absences, finding the stable and the unstable, and then, you know, finding those spaces to work, to care enough to put the worst toxins and the most affected first in our praxis. Bring the children into focus. <laughs> to embrace plurality as a principle for cognitive and hermeneutic justice, because so much possibility knowledge is sitting in the languages and the cultures that have been subjugated and excluded over so long, so many hundreds of years, if not more. Cross the boundaries, challenge the oppressive power structures, build agency power together. Unearth the fertile contradictions honestly, because so much possibility resides in the cracks where these, you know, hide and open up. This uh, time is needed for this kind of work. Reclaim, evaluate, renew, and regenerate cultural practices that work. For example, the one of the critical things that happened in this case study was they 
found the concept of ilima, which is a concept of collective farming, working together. And they brought this into focus and that helped them to, you know, do that, that work in that context. Share useful scientific insights and potentially useful anticipatory data more equitably, effectively and practically with those whom it affects most. This is an amazing case study from the Mekong Delta. And here, you know, the farmers really just needed somebody to help them to work with all the science that was being produced on what was going on there. And that was the kind of big catalyst there. Be part of the change processes. This is food communities, built stronger knowledge democracies. We started what we call a pluriversity for stock humans. And my students, <laughs> it's like a creative activity. It's very great fun because we create all these different departments uh, that you can you know, have instead of the ones that we have today. Mm, and here is the uh, seismic survey, coastal work, amazing. They worked with these maps with all this anticipatory data, with the scientific data of what happens when you do these seismic surveys. And they were able to shift the environmental legis legislation and stop shell, these coastal communities, amazing. The first time I've seen such power in, in that collective type of work. And right at the heart of it is this concept that we're now working with, which we call ukukunga. It's a concept that comes from Isikosa communities where they hold space for each other for like relational care. And it's often practiced during and after sort of funerals, but in that space, it allows the, the, the family regenerative, regenerative space. And we're using it now as a sort of pedagogical concept in our community. And we're thinking it's quite, quite a productive concept because it's about holding space for possibility knowledge and for regenerate, regeneration to rise. So it's an interesting process. It's, it's, it's very important. We never knew what to name it before, but with this concept, we're able to, to uh, see what is happening there. So just in conclusion, I have a few, what I would call subtle but important points that I wanted to leave you with. And that is that, this comes from Engelstrom again. He says, the first step of development or change often requires breaking away from a closed category whose inhabitants are doomed to stagnation or marginality. So that breaking away process is so crucial. And then what possibility knowledge does, I think, is it allows for that breaking away. It's not the same as the possibility of knowledge which is more like the notion of latent knowledge, closely associated to that, but it's more explicitly brought forth than latent knowledge. So there's something kind of active in the notion of the possibility knowledge. It's also liminal because you, got, you can't like see it or feel it until it kind of has emerged. So it's there, but it's not yet there. So there's something about, uh, about the liminality of it, the emergence it's difficult to name or to grasp until it's realized and then and until actually it can be stabilized again. So it's almost ironical, you know, but very important. And it is there at the intersection of past, present and future. So there's something about the space. And I like this quote here, honor the space between no longer and not yet, because it's there where this possibility knowledge uh, opens up. So possibility knowledges are co-created with people as they mobilize their agency. So it's not just co-creating knowledge with people. It's co-creating knowledge with people as they mobilize their agency. You see, there's a, there's a difference there. Subtle but important. Its outcomes are often not known beforehand, although there may be ethical directionality or motive that is shaping the emergence of possibility knowledges. So we don't know what's going to happen but we do sometimes know what is motivating. We know if people want their freedom. We know if people don't want to be subjugated. We know what the, what the movement is, but we don't know what the outcome is. So possibility knowledges may be shaped by stabilized knowledge. In fact, they always are. Or they can also be guided and inspired by anticipatory knowledges. But we should not reduce possibility knowledges to either of these. And this is the subtle kind of point that I wanted to make. And for me, in possibility knowledges lies the pulse of democracy and the heartbeat of expansive learning. 
and it, it, what it can do in building regenerative, more just futures. Because it involves what we do in relation to what anticipatory knowledge producers, scientists, storytellers can do for us. So it's like something happening that's important there. And this is the key point that I wanted to leave you with. And that is that everyone, everywhere, those children with the plastic bottles, uh, the uh, students and communities that are stopping the shell seismic surveys, everyone, everywhere can destabilize stabilize knowledge to create and co-create possibility knowledge. And to creating these ukukunga learning spaces for mobilizing possibility knowledges is a foundation of justice in a complex world. And the reason for this is very profound actually for me because um, I think it holds social engineering at bay. And one of the things we have to be so careful of with anticipatory work, I think, is that it can lend itself towards social engineering, somebody deciding for the other what their life should be or what their future should be. And I grew up in a society of, you know, dominated by social engineering. So I have a very keen understanding of it and also very deep care to avoid it uh, going forward. So for me, this work uh, is very important. It's, it's a space for holding social engineering at bay while we do the important work that we do of producing the kinds of knowledges that we need for the future, but unless we can put them into process with people to make their, to, to come, come with us in making the choices, we can, we can end up in that difficult space. So that's where I wanted to end up with, with this beautiful picture by Diana Sinclair. And uh, just to say thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for inviting me. And I also just wanted to acknowledge my sister who does this beautiful artwork for me. <laughs> So thank you very much, everybody. So we just wanted to send our bit of Ubuntu from us to you. And so on behalf of the organizing committee and the conference, we say thank you. Gracias, salamat, omoteo. Here you go. Thank you very much.